listening to the Shared Security Podcast with Tom Eston and Scott Wright, exploring the trust you put in people, apps, and technology. We are joined by a special guest, Patrick McNeil. You've actually been on the show before, Patrick, haven't you? Yes, I have. Thanks for having me back, Tom. Yeah, Patrick uh, was on a episode of our weekly Blaze where he was talking about hotel room security and privacy. And uh, you have had some adventures uh, <laughs> in the uh, area of uh, hotels. Didn't you have a story about blood stains on the carpet or something like that? <laughs> yeah, there was a uh, inner loop of Chicago hotel, and uh, it was on Martin Luther King Drive, and and basically I had old dried blood stains on the carpet and the wall and the curtains and they had no other rooms available. So it was, it was kind of gross. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's never a good thing. You walk into a hotel <laughs> room and there's blood everywhere. <laughs> I felt like uh, coming to America, you know, the Eddie Murphy movie where there's like the, <laughs> the tape outline of like the body in, in the apartment. Yeah. yeah. Did you get yeah. out your black light and go around the room too? Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> No, that's that's not good. So um, so before we get into today's episode, which is about home security, we've got a really good episode for you. And uh, I'm really excited to introduce Patrick here in a second, but officially introduce Patrick. But um, just wanted to mention our two sponsors, Silent Pocket and Edgewise Networks. So if you're looking for ways and uh, you know hardware and wallets and Faraday bags and all of those awesome things to protect your digital privacy, you can check out silent-pocket.com. And if you use the discount code shared security, you get 15% off your order during checkout, which is pretty cool. And Edgewise Networks, um, they have been also a longtime sponsor of the show. Uh, they just came out with something called Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. So that actually went live, their new product uh, yesterday, I believe. So uh, you can check them out at edgewise.net for more information. And without further ado, let's introduce Patrick McNeil, our physical security expert, who will be talking about home security. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks again. So maybe talk a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, all this stuff around physical security. Sure. Yeah. So um, I first encountered, I guess, the, the sport of lockpicking at DEF CON 16 and actually wandered into a lockpick village and, you know, like like everybody else, uh, total noob, within a couple hours started opening some locks and from there was just absolutely hooked. Uh, you know, and then, then a few years later, I uh, started participating in what, what was supposed to be kind of the local uh, – tool or the open organization of lock pickers chapter here in Raleigh. And we eventually named ourselves Oak city lock sport. So I've been running Oak city lock sport for about eight years now, and we've grown the chapter to about 140 members. And we typically have 25 to 30 people show up for meetings monthly. Um, and then I, I started really, you know, I, seeing all the physical security talks at, di at different conferences by people like uh, Deviant. And about uh, 18 months ago, a friend of a friend asked me to, if I would be interested in doing some physical security work for them. And so I ended up doing some 1099 through Stern Security here in Raleigh and have been doing physical assessments since then. Nice, nice. And you do work for a, a small software company <laughs> that, that yes, I happen to work yes. for. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's my side gig. The physical pen testing stuff is a side yes. gig. I, my my yeah. main gig is actually uh, uh, application security, and, and the company I work for is kind enough to uh, let me have a side gig. Awesome. So why don't we get right into it? Um, I think we wanted to start with doors, locks, and windows, the outside of your house, right? <laughs> right your first right. line of defense. Right. So, I mean, the most common question that I typically get uh, when I give talks and when, when people show up to a, an Oak City Locksport meeting is, what do you have on your door? And really, it's all about the threat model like any other security challenge. So, 
I have a typical consumer lock on my door. It's nothing crazy. It's a Schlage brand lock. However, you know, I've, I've made some upgrades to mine and we can kind of talk through some of the upgrades that you can make and why you might want to make them. But the other question that I'll, I'll turn around to people is, are your windows and doors actually locked right now? And do you know that they're actually locked? Because a lot of people get lazy about that um, or they'll leave the house and they'll have the, the deadbolt and the handle set and they only lock the handle set and don't worry about the deadbolt. And the handle set is not really going to stop a very strong, you know, push against it. It's that deadbolt that they really need. Yeah. Um, my, my door is not locked. I can tell you that right now because I'm home. <laughs> You're home. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, but there's, I mean, what is the, what's the deal with like, should people lock their doors when they're home? I mean, does it, is it based just on your threat model of your yeah. neighborhood and where you live? I think it's that's total threat model. If I was in a, a big city, higher crime area, I would. I'm in sleepy Raleigh, North Carolina, one of the safest areas in the country. So I, I don't typically worry about that. I mean, of course, it, it helps to have dogs running around down, downstairs and, you know, security cameras at my perimeter to kind of ward people off. Yeah. So that helps. So. So, yeah, I, I actually. Um, when, when you, we were kind of going over the agenda for this episode, I put it out on the, the tool Slack. It's like their national Slack to see like, hey, guys, what, what should I talk about? Do you guys have any tips? So I did actually have some input from uh, Night Owl, Maddie, and Max Power kind of sharing some experiences and stuff. And Night Owl is actually a professional locksmith as well. So I kind of got the locksmith perspective on things. Nice. Cool. Nice. So what is it about locks that people need to know with their home? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, again, it, it goes back to the threat model, how much you want to spend on a lock and everything. But um, a criminal is more likely to bash in a window or, you know, try to kick kick down the kick down the door, take a hammer to, to the lock or something like that. So there's definitely a uh, kind of risk versus return model when it comes to the lock and it also comes down to you know your your threat model that i'm not saying buy a cheap lock because it's not going to work i'm definitely not saying that but you need to look at the construction of your entryways and you know determine whether it makes sense for you certainly if if you're in the city and you know like your your entrance from the hallway is pretty solid there's no windows there yeah, you could probably invest in a higher end lock. Somebody like me that's got tons of windows, it's kind of diminishing returns. Um, if we look at the most common ways that thieves are going to get in, besides breaking you know, a window or, or something like that, um, bumping would probably be the next go-to. And uh, Scott, could you possibly bring up the, the slide that I had on, on bumping? Yeah. Just one sec, yeah. Sure. So bumping is basically an attack where they make a key that has that has been cut to the lowest depth on every single notch. And the objective here is uh, there you go. So there's a slide. You can see there's just a very little uh, little triangle on for each each of those pins. Basically, the objective is to just barely graze the bottom of the pin. And what they do is they insert the key, pull it out. Uh, half a notch and then actually hit it with a hammer while simultaneously turning and what happens is the key contacts all of the key pins at once and forces them to rise pushing up the blue driver pins the driver pins are what is basically keeping that lock from turning so the key pins push all the driver pins up and as they start to fall down they get caught above the shear line because of the turning pressure that's being put on the key and then the lock opens up. So it, 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 it can be difficult to learn, but it's a fairly uh, easy thing once you've developed the reflex for it. And it can look almost as simple as, you know, somebody just opening the, the door with a regular key. And there's special tools, right, that are used for uh, sort of creating the, <laughs> the vibrations, is it? Or Yeah, so, so you have to have a key blank that fits that particular uh, lock. So like, 
like for Schlag, the most common keyway would be the SC1. So you have to already have the SC1 blank and have pre-cut that or, you know, purchased a, a bump key set online. But typical, you know, American consumers, if you have a very small set of a few keys, you, you probably have most of the keyways, mm -hmm. um, at, at least in, you know, suburban residential type areas anyways. Um, and then, of course, you need a bump hammer. They, they do make specialty bump hammers made out of plastic and rubber. Some people can actually do it with just the back of a screwdriver once they get practiced enough. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so, really. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> so you, you, you can actually protect against uh, <laughs> a lock bumping attack. Not too. you're getting your bump, your lock bump. What's that, Tom? So, so you... Yeah, I say not uh, now if you're getting your <laughs> no, lock exactly, bumps, then exactly. it's not good. So, so you can protect against uh, lock bumping if, um, if your your existing lock didn't already have like it, it might have on the on the package anti bumping or something like that. If you need to retrofit your older lock that is is currently bumpable, um, and this kind of goes up to the next skill level, you can either bring your lock to a locksmith. Or if you have a little bit of mechanical, uh, you know, handiness, whatever, you can get a repinning kit that includes spool pins. So basically those blue driver pins that are shown. Oh, thanks. Uh, those, those blue driver pins, you'll see the one on the left is shaped mm -hmm. like a spool. And the one on the right is what we call serrated. So it looks kind of like a, a corkscrew around it. And essentially when that, key pin is pushed up on if there's any sort of turning pressure on the uh, on the keyway the lip of the bottom lip of that spool is going to get caught on the on the top of the core as it's as it's coming up and with the serrated pin it, it'll get caught multiple times so any sort of turning pressure that you're using while you're trying to hit the bump key with a bump hammer will end up catching so basically it's, it's a bump protection. Now, if you're going to retrofit your lock or, you know, kind of do anything, anything that you're mentioning here is, I mean, this it stuff is definitely worth calling a professional. Or is I mean, it worth calling a professional? You have to be fairly mechanically savvy to do that. Um, you can get spool pins online for like a couple bucks. Um, so it's, it's really pretty inexpensive, but if you're not mechanically savvy, it's probably better to go to a locksmith. Um, you know, and I, I think, uh, uh, hiring a locksmith is also a good idea for uh, getting a better lock in general. So the, the types of locks that we will get from your big box hardware store are uh, rated or they're basically ANSI rated to a class three. The ones that you get from locksmiths can go up to class one and two. They don't typically sell them to consumers. And, and what the differences are, and I, I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact numbers, but the ratings are based on how many strikes the lock can take before it breaks and at what, um, like how many pounds of force each strike can be. So basically something that is a class three is not going to be able to take as okay. many hammer hits um, or, you know, kicks uh, directly into it. So, so you'll be able to get mm -hmm. a stronger lock from a locksmith. You know, the, okay. the one, sorry, go ahead. That's good. Good to know. <laughs> I, I was so I was going to say that nope, the nope. thing that I will see most frequently, <laughs> probably though, the same thing. <laughs> I mean, let's forget about how strong the lock is or the quality of the lock. The thing that I see the most frequently, especially if the homeowner has done the installation of the lock, is an improperly installed latch and dead latch. Um, so basically, if you, you, if you look at your exterior doors, you have two parts to your latch. There is the, the really large part that's the main part of the latch. And then the other part is the dead latch. It's a very small part. Typically, when the door closes, people will assume that the entire latch and dead latch need to fit into that hole in the strike plate. And it couldn't be further from the truth. What you want to happen is as the door is swinging shut, the latch hits the strike plate. Everything gets compressed in. And then as the door fully closes, the latch will come out and fit into this into the hole in the strike plate. But the dead latch should be depressed. And what that does is it locks the latch out into place mm -hmm. so that it can't be 
uh, we call it loited, but it's basically the old credit card trick where you, you either push in and you reach on, or you reach around the back and kind of push the latch in. If that dead latch is properly installed, you can't do the old credit card trick. Cool. Yeah, so, you know, it's just one of those common things. And, and I bet you, uh, for everybody that listens to this, look at all your exterior doors. You're bound to have one that isn't installed correctly. So what would you check for just to make sure that uh, the dead latch gets uh, left yeah. depressed? Or is that how it works? Yes, yes. So basically, you, you want to close your door and see if... Um, uh, see if that dead latch is pressed in. Typically, there's there's a little bit of a gap that you can actually you know look in beside right. the strike plate and see whether it's being pushed on. Um, if you can't tell you know whether it's moving in or out, you can always put some uh, little marker like magic marker lines on it, and then close it and see like which lines you can see. Right. You know, draw draw like a, a diagonal so you can see how much of that diagonal you can see. Right. Good idea. Mm-hmm. So what about windows? Like, I mean, like you mentioned, you know, a criminal is just going to throw a brick through your, your window. Uh, you know, that's an easy access method instead of, you know, they see a nice strong yeah, lock on I mean, your door. They're definitely probably gonna go if you've a got window, a better right? window, you know, multiple panes and stuff like that, they're going to be harder to break. But um, people assume that uh, whatever security came with the window is what you get. But you could always buy an aftermarket, you know, window lock to put on and not put it up top where you typically find it, but on the side or on the bottom or somewhere else. So you have more than one locking mechanism. So they can't mm -hmm. do like, especially if you've got older, like the wooden windows, with the little kind of turn latch. Some of those can be bypassed with just a, a simple knife yeah. or a thin piece of metal. Um, as long as they're not, you know, overly tight. So putting something on the inside on the side that they either a don't even know about, or B just can't, uh, can't do that trick on would help. Cool. Is there something that, um, like you often see the magnetic um, sensors, right, that are now wireless. Is, is right, there a way right. that attackers uh, try and get by those? Or Yeah, so so the, the, the magnetic sensors that you see on both doors and windows for the consumer alarm systems, um, there's a couple different ways that, that you could potentially get past them. One of them is actually using a... Uh, a super magnet so basically all these these types of switches work with what's called a reed sensor and the reed sensor just has a, a really thin piece of metal that when it moves from one side of the sensor to the other because it loses the magnetic contact it completes a circuit and the alarm goes off if you can put a super magnet beside the reed sensor it, it keeps the uh, alarm circuit from from closing and, and the alarm from going off so it's you know kind of sliding it in as you're opening, it can be a little difficult. Um, the other thing is, while they are illegal by the FCC, uh, you know, and by federal law, there are plans for electronic jammers online. So you can actually build a jammer that will completely jam, you know, the alarm system. And then, then it's kind of down to, does the alarm system have uh, anti-jamming protections or not? Some of them actually are, are intelligent enough to know when a jammer has been set up. And, mm. and go off, but uh, not so sure that that's really that prevalent in kind of the, the low end consumer market. So that does kind of lead to, um, so you mentioned checking all your doors. So that's front, back. Um, I know there's a lot of, I know where mm. I live, there's garages that have side doors, which I know I hear about in the news of um, thieves breaking into the garage. Um, what about <laughs> anything else outside, yeah, like yeah. your car, right? Well, you, um, always lock your car. You, I mean, you covered a bunch sense, of stuff right? there, man. So but, I'm going to ask um, you to back what up other, a second. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the car. So, so, so garages, <laughs> yeah, you have the side right, I'm gonna door. Back up. I'm I, I try up. to have, um, uh, you know, cameras and things like that covering every entrance, inclusive of, of the, the garage doors. Um, but I, a lot of people assume that the garage is safe. And because they've got the big sliding door and maybe the side door is locked. So the interior door from the garage into their, ho their house, they don't typically lock even when they leave the house, right? So what, what people don't realize is there is actually a yeah. tool that you can use to 
shove in between the garage and the, the top threshold of that big garage door and actually reach through, especially like if you've got one of the automatic garage door openers, you can actually reach through and hook the, uh, uh, the, the, I guess the rope or whatever that releases the door from the garage door opening mechanism. And then once you pull that, you can just, you know, pull the door right up and go right inside. So, um, it's, it's pretty easy to obtain it online and it can be a bit of a challenge if you have a solid door to find the rope. Uh, so you'd prefer a window or you could have a spotter that's maybe looking in a side, side garage door or something. Um, but yeah, people don't realize that that's out there. Um, so others, you mentioned cars. Yeah. I mean, it, in my neighborhood, people are apt to leave the car doors unlocked because it's so sleepy. And we always see, you know, people complaining on next door about a car break in. I'm sorry, but it's not a break in if you left your, your, your car door unlocked. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And your garage um, but door opening yeah, in the car. People right? tend to leave a lot of things yeah. that they don't want to forget in their cars, like their access badges for work and things like that. <laughs> so, yes, um, maybe I could break into your car and grab your badge. But if your badge is laying face down and there is actually a facility code and badge number printed on the back of it, uh, yeah, I can use a Proxmark and just program that in and, you know, flash a badge and now I'm you. <laughs> and if I already know where you work, like you're, you're targeted or something, then, yeah, that's easy enough to, to copy and badge in. And now a word from our sponsor, Edgewise Networks. The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is unprotected attack paths that allow threats to compromise vulnerable targets in the cloud and data center. But traditional micro-segmentation is too complex and time-consuming and offers limited value that's hard to measure. But there's a better approach, Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation delivering results immediately with a security outcome that's provable and management that's zero touch. At the core of Edgewise auto segmentation is zero trust identity, which automatically builds unique identities for all communicating software and devices by combining cryptographic properties of the workload with risk classifications. Edgewise protects any application in any environment without any architectural changes. Edgewise provides measurable improvement by quantifying attack path risk reduction and demonstrates isolation between critical services so that your applications can't be breached. Visit edgewise.net to find out more about how Edgewise can help stop data breaches. So maybe we just take a step back in terms of like identifying the, the typical criminal, like who causes the crime of breaking yeah. into somebody's house. Cause you hear kind of every extreme on the news, right? You hear of the middle of the day, someone breaks in and then a guy that has a gun in their house is able to, you know, shoot the guy and defend themselves. Right. And then you hear everything from, you know, people, you know, just yeah. criminals looking for drugs and looking for prescription medications and things like that. And so they're looking for the easy way in. So, if a criminal is just like walking down the street, what are some things that might deter if, right. they're, if they're not targeting yeah. from? Right. So, it, if, a, if it's, you know, yeah, I mean, into it, your house, I guess. yeah, Let's residential start, start wise, there. if they're targeting yeah. you, I mean, most of the stuff that people have are, is not going to last very long. But, but for sure, um, kind of what what you're talking about is yeah. what we would call crime prevention through environmental design or or CP CPTED, and, and basically. You know, they're, they're looking for soft targets, uh, you know, yep. targets of opportunity. And you can kind of dissuade them a bit by certainly, you know, uh, doing things like putting up cameras, um, you know, like having a, a ring or nest doorbell. So they, they know if they approach the door, they're going to get recorded. I, I put thorn bushes all around my exterior windows. So. You know that that may be a little bit of a deter deterrent. They're gonna have to they're gonna have to pay the price if they try to go in through <laughs> a window, anyways. Um, you know, I don't I don't know how well a, a beware of dog or a, a fake uh, alarm sticker or something would really work. But you know, if you if you have you know visible alarm sensors on windows and things, that that's probably a deterrent as well. Um, and of course, if you have a really barky dog, 
you know, and they can actually hear it. That's a little different. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. man. Some, so a big dog, some right? of those, some like... of those little dogs are, are more vicious. Than <laughs> the, the bigger big the ones, dog, the better. The big ones make more noise. Even if they're wimps, they're, they're probably a deterrent. So anything, yeah. so you mentioned the kind of like the alarm signs, right? And do you think criminals kind of, do you think that's really a deterrent? Because you can buy, you know, you don't have to yeah. have like EDT, right? I don't, I don't think that's a deterrent. On so one of, one of the guys know, on the tool forum actually yard. said, like, if you're going to put up a fake one, make sure it's actually a, a company that does business in your area, right? So, so the thieves are used to seeing all these different ones and they'll see something that, yeah. This doesn't make sense. Like it, it's <laughs> got to be fake. Um, and the ones that Acme are, that are company. yeah, the, the ones that are totally, totally <laughs> fake. I'm sure they've probably seen them on eBay and stuff like that. They, they know what they're looking at. If, if they're, if they're experienced, I mean, if they're, they're high or something and they're just looking for a quick, uh, quick break in, you know, they're not really professionals. They'll, they'll probably fall for it, but somebody who's, yeah. who's just going around burglarizing on a regular basis um, yeah. that's in it for the money, they'll, they'll probably know what it's about. Another interesting question I was thinking of is, uh, mm -hmm. can you learn anything from uh, yeah, like, Wi-Fi uh, network IDs uh, just by war driving by somebody's host to understand more about what their alarm system is like? Mm, that I'm not sure of. That I'm not sure mm -hmm. of. I mean... <clears throat> Uh, and exactly. I say unless the yeah. alarm system has its own kind of Wi-Fi, yeah. you know, set up that's <laughs> that is beaconing. I would hope that there's nothing like yeah. that, but um, that is interesting. Yeah, and Gabe here in the chat room said uh, they have a oh, yeah. fake blinking go. light mounted I mean, the, the other thing you can do, window. too, especially so, if you're going to be out of the house cool. for a while, you're traveling, they actually do make... Um, Similar, similar to the old like switch that just turns your your lamps on and off, they actually do make a fake uh, TV kind of LED, and and basically it it changes brightness levels constantly, and has kind of that whitish uh, or bluish glow that a TV would normally give off. So if you put that on a timer switch as well, it looks like somebody is watching TV, especially if you put it near a front window. So. It's kind of a deterrent to make it look like somebody's home. Then the neighbors are going to complain because they think you left your TV on for the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so let's, uh, we have mentioned cameras already, but let's talk about surveillance cameras. And I know this is a lot of people talk about it because the market right now, I think it's just saturated, mm -hmm. right? With, nest and ring and you know everybody seems to be getting into this game now um with having these well i mean mm -hmm. frankly extremely cheap cameras right that are easy to buy easy to install they're all wireless what's your what's your take on kind of surveillance <laughs> cameras and you know should people be uh, out i mean this, this is heavily weighted towards my own personal what's your, opinion what's your take on, on that? that but i mean my my take is is they're probably good as a deterrent Sure. Um, yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, your it's kind of comes down to your threat model, whether you want local recording or cloud recording and all that. And um, I, I have personal opinions about which brands are better. So I, I don't know that I'll I want to come out and say which one I think is the best. But <laughs> my, my opinion is completely based on a couple of my friends who competed <laughs> in the uh, IoT uh <laughs> village capture the flag contest at defcon and they basically said hey there uh -huh. was this one brand we couldn't get into anything but we completely pwned everybody else's stuff so uh yeah do the research yeah yeah do, do your research yeah. and and uh uh you know privacy yeah. there's privacy concerns of course if you're uploading video to the cloud do you necessarily trust th that service provider um or you just want to have something local i mean there, there's always things like, you know, if the power goes out, is it battery powered or hardwired? So are you going to miss everything? And your your backup system, your local backup system is is probably plugged in anyway. So, you know, I, I just think it's a good idea to have a, a camera as a deterrent. Yeah. Now, do you, do you think people should go crazy and have cameras like every corner of their house? And then because I know like Ring has the spotlight cam, right, that you can install above your garage and then, the you know, the ring at the, at the front and you can put one in the back. Like what's kind of the general recommendation? Yeah, I mean, we're going to. 
go all like, out. Again, it's always threat model, surveys. right? But I, I would like to have something in the front and something in the back because, you know, if yeah. you can at least try to get an angle so you can see most of the, the incoming approach to the house. And then in the back, if, especially if you've mm -hmm. got a privacy fence, that's the place where somebody's going to get in and, you know, now they can spend some time trying to, to uh, get into the back and you won't necessarily, you know, be able to catch them. So mm -hmm. like if they, they go in a neighbor's yard and then climb over the fence, people can't see what they're doing and they can spend some more time back there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you have a, yeah, like a, you have woods in your backyard. Yeah. Or, I'm lucky you know, enough that I, I only need a couple a little more cameras remote, to, to right? capture like um, all the entrances to my house. And then I have a, a doorbell camera as well. Yeah. So what about, um, you had mentioned already about when you, when you go on vacation or you're, you're going to be gone for a, a period of time, what's, what's the recommendation of, you know, making sure your house is secure. I mean, we can get into alarms and alarm systems in a minute, but is there anything that, um, you know, you would recommend, like, I know back in the day, I remember my parents had like one of those, uh, dial controls where that turned the lights on and off at a certain time, you know, you know, so it looked like, Ooh, somebody's home because the lights are going on. Is there, is that uh, well, still kind of the, the, there, the best? I think that is the best that, practice. There we I think do? there's an old thing you should do as well. Um, get to know your neighbors. I, the, I, I've, I've noticed over the last decade or two, it seems like new people move in and people don't go to welcome them. They don't come over to say hi. It's just kind of like I'm going to hide in my own little box here. I mean, honestly, getting to know your neighbors is one of the best defenses because <laughs> they know something's yeah. kind of yeah. out of place. Right. Um, other than that. Yeah. Do a quick check before you leave to make sure everything's actually locked. Um, yeah. make those security updates on your house and then actually, uh, like you said, use the timer, set up the little fake TV thing. But yeah, I think getting to know your neighbors is probably the best protection around, especially if you've got the, the busy body neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I, I have one of those. Um, <clears throat> But that actually is a, is a good thing. Just to your point, I remember when I just moved into this house a couple of years ago, um, you know, I, they didn't know that somebody moved in the house and I was just <laughs> walking around the yard and my neighbor came up to me and said, can I help you? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, can I help you? Yes, this you is can, my you house. can mow my lawn like, for me. Thanks. Oh, I didn't know you, you moved in. And it, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, you're right. I, neighbors is knowing your neighbors yeah. because yeah. they're and kind not of to name names but uh, recently i had a situation Just where uh, you, you see uh, an open garage door next door and you <laughs> text the guy and say yeah did you know your door's open <laughs> so <laughs> it's always good good to know you know uh, exactly yeah they're uh, able to give you a yeah. note, heads up things may not mm -hmm. be right cool. yeah and you're, you're talking about you know cameras and you know when you're away from the house and stuff like that i, I know some people um consider or, or have set up cameras inside their house. And that, that part has always kind of skeeved me out a little bit, just, you know, the whole, like who, who has access to those recordings and are, yeah. are they really private? And yeah, no, no, thank you. I mean, maybe I would consider setting up an internal camera for the period where I'm going to be gone. Um, but Definitely yeah, not. not. Not permanently. We'll do another yeah, episode on uh, on Airbnb uh, surveillance. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can of worms. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a whole other. So, so Tom, yeah. when we were talking through the agenda, there was, not there was good. one thing not I, I actually didn't think about, and it just popped into my head right now um, when, when Scott mentioned Airbnbs. So I, I gave a talk uh, two weekends ago at Kakalaki Con and again at Layer 8 this past weekend. And one of the things I covered was uh, the key boxes that some people will put either on their door handle or, you know, screwed onto a wall. And, you know, maybe or, or maybe a contractor would use them. But Airbnb, yeah, exactly. Realtors. Airbnbs tend to use them extensively Realtors, where yeah. they, they change mm -hmm. the code and they, they tell you like what it is before you get there. And some municipalities like Toronto, I mean, they've, they've actually gone back and forth with banning Airbnb altogether because of the fact that there are so many key boxes all over the place. What people don't realize is that most of those key boxes are very easily decoded. So, Kitty is one of the more common ones. There's a master, 
uh, 54, 22, or 23, um, and there's a master, I think it's a 540. Every single one of those can be decoded within a matter of 20 or 30 seconds. And now I've got, I've got your key. I don't necessarily um, have to go in right then. I could take a photo of your key or impression of your key and come back whenever the heck I want. So I, I, I tend to stay away from most of the, the residential key boxes. Um, there is one that I like, and it's the, the kitty key box that actually has like a regular dial combo on it. That one I have not been able to figure out a decode method for. And um, when I checked on, on the tool Slack, I haven't really found anybody who knows any, any decode method for it yet. So the uh, the the elect or sorry the uh, decoding method that you're talking about is that just yeah. for electronic or is there another physical way to decode the yeah sorry so so these key boxes are typically just a physical uh, mm -hmm. box that you can put a key inside of and the the, the mechanism is purely physical right so okay. with with the the like the push button style locks you can put a lot of pressure on the latch. And then as you press the individual buttons, you can actually feel some feedback on the latch. And you know that that number is part of the combination. And these key boxes don't require you to have the number in any specific order. Each button is essentially an on off switch. Right. So as long as you get the numbers, not necessarily in any order, then you can get yeah. in. And then the other style is kind of the, the rotary dial combo locks. And those can be decoded with, with a very thin a uh, piece of metal called a shim, mm -hmm. and you just put it on the side of the dial, and as you're turning the dial, you'll actually feel the shim move into the little notch on every dial, and then you mm -hmm. rotate each dial, like all, all of them together, rotate them up one number at a time until you find the spot that releases the lock. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Cool. So did we cover all the stuff uh, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes? We're going to do a competition. So we want to make it, sure that uh, all the questions were, were covered, right? So uh, did we cover them all, Tom, do you think? Yeah. Okay. I think we did. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I had, I had one you had anything thing else I, to I add, Patrick. We kind of skipped we'll, we'll a little bit, right which the was like, and... if you are going to go the consumer grade lock route, as opposed to going with a uh, professional locksmith, like how to maybe find a better lock. Um, yeah, so so just just a couple of tips. Like oh, when you good. go to yeah, the hardware store, that. if you can kind of jiggle around the package and you can see the key on the inside, you want to look for a key that has what we call aggressive bidding. So those notches in the key, do they just kind of go like, eh, and they kind of bump up and down and they're they're fairly flat or do they go aggressively up and down? If, if you have one that has a pretty deep notch kind of towards the front of the key, that's a little bit harder to pick. Um, I mean, the alternative, too, is you can just bring your existing lock to a locksmith and ask them to rekey it um, with a more aggressive, you know, key. All right. All right. The other thing to do is look at the, the front of the, um, the lock, you know, the, the core itself. And those little squiggles that go back and forth, those are what we call wards. Uh, something like a quick set or a schlag, it tends to be fairly open. There's not a, not a bunch of back and forth. But if you find ones that, that do have aggressive wards on them, those are just a little bit harder to pick. Oh, there you go. You got the... Uh, I'm almost there. One sec. Almost there. Yeah. So, yeah. so those things are called wards. So like on the left, that would be uh, you know, a pretty easy uh, keyhole to get some picks into. As you move to the right, you see that they, they're starting to get harder. So the one on the right would be something like a Medico, where you're, you're never going to get into that. Uh, well, you could. Some people could, but most people are not going to be able to get into that. Yeah. Looks like a bit I, of conversion required. To that. That's a hardcore lock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so the, the keys will get crazier. The face of the lock will get crazier. And certainly the stuff on the right, that's, that's the kind of stuff you're going to get from a locksmith. The stuff on the left is going to be more your consumer grade that you get uh, in the big box store. So, but yeah, look look for an aggressively cut key. And if you're comparing two equally priced locks, I don't know, get, get the one with a better keyway. Nice. All right. So, are we ready for the competition, guys? Yep. All right. So, this competition is sponsored yeah, by Clickarmor. <laughs> 
And if nobody knows what click armor is yet, you haven't been listening to the podcast, obviously. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just do a very quick 20 second. It's my company. <laughs> So it's an advanced gamification (laughs) or gamified learning uh, program for security awareness. And it uses game-based learning techniques uh, to engage and improve retention of knowledge uh, rather than people just clicking through your uh, typical computer-based training and then then your quiz and you're good for a year. We actually uh, get uh, some interesting challenges and games and quizzes for people to play and and learn as they play and then repeat the activities. and the, the bottom line is we can actually provide uh, some metrics for threat scenarios that uh, right now executives don't have any visibility into how vulnerable their, their staff are other than the uh, basic security or phishing assessments, essentially. So that's uh, really what we're uh, providing in Click Armor. And in a, in a month, I'm going to be uh, able to give some cool demos on this uh, during our live presentation. So that'll be fun. But the prize today we've been advertising is a $50 U.S. Amazon gift card. I have to say U.S. obviously because I'm in Canada here and <laughs> people here will be more excited about a $50 U.S. card than, uh, well, anybody would be, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you could if you want. I haven't bought it yet. So it can't I'll be in Canadian? Come on. <laughs> anyway, so here's how we're going to do the competition. So anybody who wants to play along, you don't have to be in the live chat room. You can actually just go to... Uh, either an app, as is all on the board behind me, it's uh, called Poll Everywhere, uh, or you can go to uh, the, just the URL, pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash streetwise. Uh, and when you get there, it'll ask you for a, uh, a screen name. So you can just type in anything you want, but it would be helpful if you want to participate, uh, send us an email or a, a message in the chat room what, uh, <laughs> what screen name you're going to use so that we don't end up with the... Uh, the WKRP problem of the uh, wrong person claiming the, uh, the prize, right? Uh, that's an old, old reference. <laughs> so uh, we're going to uh, get you in a second into the competition. If I can uh, start this thing now, we should give people a, a moment, but uh, it's going to take me obviously a minute to uh, get this thing running. So one second, we're going to go into uh, Firefox and run this thing. Hey, look at that. All right. Oops. The back. <laughs> it's like okay. you've never done this before, Scott. It's, it's, it's kind of like I've never done this before, which is true. <laughs> so it's the shared security competition. It's the home security edition. Thanks to Patrick. So uh, if uh, we we'll give people another couple of seconds to register at polev.com slash streetwise or use the Poll Everywhere app and just enter the name streetwise as your screen name. Uh, so what we're going to start with is when you look for a keyed lock set, what feature can you use to identify higher resistance to attack? And so in a second, you're going to see some multiple choice questions and they're going to last for 20 seconds. And so everybody in the app or on the website should see a list of options and you can pick your option and you got a few seconds. And then after everybody's selected their options, we've got one result in. Oh, we don't have a lot of results. This must be a tough <laughs> one. Well, we have one result. Let's see who. Oh, we got. Oh, they got it wrong too. Stainless steel keys. <laughs> so the answer was aggressive bidding, as Patrick just mentioned. Right? <laughs> it's the, uh, the deep cuts uh, in mm-hmm. the key. That makes it harder. All right. So a, sta- so, a stainless steel key would definitely be a stronger key, that's for sure, than the the low end stuff they typically give you. Okay. Well, that's cool. Uh, but we talked about aggressive bidding, so that's the right answer. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, Loopy Tuesday. That was the uh, the person who did not score there. Um, so what is what do attackers use to counter the typical window and door sensors? So they could use super magnets, they could use jam kickers, they could use swing stops, or they could use freeze mist. Um, I'm not sure if any, all those things actually exist, but uh, we did talk about one of these things in the... Freeze mist, freeze mist. (laughs) No cheating. (laughs) 
<laughs> we should have, uh, yeah, we should have the little uh, clues that come down, like in uh, the NTN trivia that, uh, in the pub. All right, and we got super magnets. Nobody got it. Even Loopy Tuesday is still at zero. We're going to have to... Uh, <laughs> So, what's the most common mistake made by consumers when installing their door locks? I think I remember this one. Let's see. Uh, we got bolts that are too long, dead latches being installed badly, hinge misalignment, or antique brass finish. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I know a certain locksmith <laughs> that hates that stuff. All right. Bolts that are too long. Oh, wow. We don't have a, a very good listening audience. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, that's right. All right. I don't know if we'll award the, give, give the award away if nobody actually uh, got any points. So <laughs> what does CPTED stand for? It's not uh, after you. No, I won't say it. Uh, <laughs> crime patterns through extended descriptions. Uh Central path through education and defense, crime prevention through environmental design, or crime prevention through easy defenses. So I like easy defenses. <laughs> See if we do any better on this. Yay, hey, there we go. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I wonder who got that one right. All right. Nice. <laughs> 750 points. That's great. Good job, Loopy Tuesday. <laughs> uh, okay. What is an easy way to secure a window at home? So you can put on a second lock on the side of the, or the bottom. You could put on a mirrored fillet. You can put on bulletproof glass. I like that one. Yeah. A alarm, alarm company sticker. Key, keyword, an easy way. Oh, okay. That's not so easy. Yeah. An easy way to secure it. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see, uh, see how Loopy did. Oh. I think yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so they're probably over a thousand now. All nice. right, they win. Nice. <laughs> the confetti flies. Yeah. Now can can they other could. people join yeah, while it's, the, it's uh, over now? So while the questions are still being asked. <laughs> so tough. Okay. Five, <laughs> five questions. Loopy Tuesday. Oh, that was okay, it. Well, Loopy right, Tuesday. Well, if you're out there's there, there's your winner. Um, hopefully, you sent us uh, an email before this ended because anybody could send us an email on it now and say, I was loopy Tuesday. So we'll see. And uh, we'll see where the $50 Amazon uh, yep. prize goes to. So, all right, just, Scott, I didn't tell you that was, I was actually loopy Tuesday. I just sent you an email. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I wasn't, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to loopy Tuesday. Very, very you sneaky, are. Patrick. Very <laughs> sneaky. We will uh, send you your $50 Amazon card. And uh, we hope this uh, goes a little more smoothly. I mean, the, the first part went great, Patrick. Thanks very much. Second part welcome. we need to practice on, but uh, we did get three. It's a world. It's a world. It was first time podcast. actually doing a contest on the podcast. So for a security know. podcast. <laughs> it, it is actually, you know, right. first time for everything. So, yeah. But, uh, well, great. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Patrick, for attending um, and for for your insight yeah, into welcome. physical security. And uh, I did too. Yeah, I, know, I learned a few awesome. things. So, so uh, how about you, Scott? We'll, uh, spread the word, and I think we'll have the recording up at some point, and uh, we'll point people to that so they can also learn from it. They won't be able yep. to participate in the competition, <laughs> sadly. So, so Tom, can I can I plug uh, uh, my talk <laughs> recording like? really quick? Yeah, uh, I was going to say if you you get, you uh, look up Kakalaki yeah, or Layer Eight on on Twitter, uh, or I guess on on YouTube, um, they will have the recordings for my 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 previous talks, and I, I actually cover the lockbox decoding in there that people may be interested in, as as well as a bunch of other corporate. Uh, like oh, enterprise cool. type of physical security stuff, but the lockbox uh, attacks is probably more relevant to you know listeners for this topic. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we can put that in the, those links in the show Sounds notes. Sounds great as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So wider distribution. So awesome. All right. Well, thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks for everyone in the chat and on YouTube and Facebook and. 
we're in three different places uh, streaming. We'll so have you back again, cool. Patrick. But uh, thanks. Yeah, we'll see you next time, <laughs> right. and thanks for Take listening. Bye bye.